Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me out uh, this evening and giving me your time um, to listen to this uh, really important topic that you know touches a lot of our lives in many ways. And um, when I was thinking of uh, this talk, I was thinking um, what to name it, and I was thinking that we should call it "You're Gonna Do What to My Breasts." But I thought <laughs> probably understanding breast imaging and what we, why we do what we do, would be a little bit better title. So. Um, So uh, just to, a little outline on what I'm going to talk about. So just some basics, because um, I'd like everyone to walk away with a little better understanding of um, um, what we do and how you can help us uh, do our job better for you. Okay? So a little bit about uh, the components of breast cancer screening, um, the breast anatomy, and what we look for and what you all should look for, and a little bit more about... Um, what's um, new out there. So, so um, I wanted this to be a little bit interactive. So, um, you know, you can do a raise of hands here. Um, what do you think, or what do you all think are the components of breast cancer screening? Should it be a mammogram only? That's A. Or B, a breast physical exam only? Or none of the other, above? Or D? Both choices, A and B. D? All right. Yay. Okay, great. Awesome. I can go home now. <laughs> no, but all women should um, really have both. You can't have just one or the other, right? Um, because uh, a mammogram is just one way to look at the breasts. And women should also undergo um, the physical exam by the referring um, provider because you know, uh, there are some things that are not going to be picked up by a mammogram, okay? There's 10 to 15 percent of, uh, of even the best of studies that are going to miss 10 to 15 percent of, uh, of uh, breast cancers. And it's not just, it's not because of that it's the mammogram doesn't work. It's just because of different factors. The density of the breast, which we'll talk about later, can mask things from being there. And some Cancers just don't really have a imaging finding. It's more something that that uh, presents as a physical exam finding. So you want your you and your physician to work together to help find that. Okay. So going to um, the components of um, going on about you know when should people um, start breast? Oop. There we go. When should people start? So, you know, I'm going to fall back on what the American Cancer Society uh, recommends. So they recommend that in, uh, for women in their 20s and 30s, they can get um, a physical exam maybe um, every three years or so in that young age, okay? But as we uh, move up in age, at, starting at age 40, should be every year, okay? So... Um, this is a physical exam by um, a healthcare provider. So, what about self breast exam? You know, that's um, you know that's a point of um, discussion, a little bit of controversy uh, behind that. So, so what statement um, applies um, to you? Um, I must do self breast exam. Anybody? Show of hands. Okay. Um, doing self breast exams are confusing to me. Show of hands. Yeah. Okay. Or I forget to do self-breast exam. I have to put my hand up for that one. Okay. So, well, what's the what what what's what should we think about about that? So, again, I'm going to fall um, to the American Cancer Society recommendations. Um, you know, breast self-exam is actually uh, something optional for women starting in, in their 20s, and they recommend that women can be told about the benefits of. Uh, self-breast exam, but there are some limitations. You know, some, some people find it, their self-breast exam very difficult. You know, people, we call it kind of the lumpy, bumpy breast. It, you know, there's so many things, you know, what, what's important, not important. It's very anxiety provoking. So these are kind of things that you can um, talk to your healthcare provider and come to a decision for yourself. You know, there's no, I don't think there's a, any right or wrong um, answer for this, okay? And actually, the U.S. Uh, Preventive uh, Services Task Force, they actually recommend against teaching 
self breast exam. That's like another, this is, you know, something that was done by the government. So, you know, where people fall, like my, my belief is there's no right or wrong. It's whatever is, you know, good for you. But talk to your healthcare provider and, and go through your beliefs and what you feel is good for you and make that decision, you know, for yourself. Okay. So um, the, mo the most important thing to get out of this is that um, women should uh, report any kind of changes in their um, breasts to their, um, to their healthcare uh, provider, okay? So, um, and you should do that right away when something comes up. So, so um, maybe you can talk about, you know, what kind of things, you know, you should bring to your, bring to your doctor's attention, How, you know, Throw out some answers out there. What what do you think you should go and tell your doctor about? Anybody? Lumps? Okay, good. Anything? Pain? I heard a pain. Discharge? Okay, very good, very good. Nipple discharge? Good, good. What else? Dimpled skin? Ooh, that's a good one. Yes, very good. I'm impressed by that answer. Dimpled skin? Very good. Wow, you, you're getting, you're just doing my talk for me. That's great. <laughs> so lump or thickening, um, breast pain, if it's focal, like maybe you could put a finger on it, or even like new, you know, whole breast pain. If it's nipple discharge, especially something that's bloody, you want to bring that up to your doctor. Any changes in your nipple? Like maybe, you know, um, I, I kind of liken uh, nipples to um, kind of like belly buttons. Sometimes everyone's an innie or an outie, but sometimes if there's a change in that thing, you, in, you know, whether it's always been out and it's all of a sudden in, that's a change. You should definitely report that to your doctor or vice versa. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I also, it's like this chicken and egg um, story. And, you know, I, um, like I said, I, those are the things that are put out by the, by the task force. I'm not, I'm not pr promoting it or... You know, I'm just saying that that's what's out there. But I agree with you that, you know, how can you tell that there's a change in your physical exam if you don't really, if you're not really doing a physical exam? But some people, you know, like in the process of their regular activities, you know, like maybe they're putting on their clothes or, you know, um, you know, showering and bathing and stuff, they happen to find something. We have a lot of people who come in and, you know, their partners recognize something, you know, they, they feel, you know, like they're, next to each other and they say, oh, you know, what's that thing that's sticking out or dimpling? I didn't notice that before. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different ways that these exam findings can manifest, you know, um, whether it's you that recognizes it or somebody else. Um, so that, but that is a very good question, I agree. So, um, so any skin changes, changes like you mentioned, the dimpling or discoloration, something, you know, you might get some different discoloration around like redness I'm almost like a rash, but it just doesn't go away. Um, or something in the axilla, that's an important thing to remember. You know, anything in your underarm area, you have to um, remember that that's an extension of, of the breast region. Okay? So, there we go. So, here's another um, thought-provoking question. At what age uh, should I start doing mammograms? 40? I heard a lot of 40s go up. 50? None of the above, 30, okay. So, very controversial question. And, um, you know, there's, again, there's these two groups out there. I'm going to put the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Preventive Task Services Task Force. It's, again, um, this is something that you have to talk, you know, to your uh, physician about. Um, but, you know, what the uh, American Cancer Society recommends is women age 40 and older should have a mammogram every year and continue, continue to do so for as long as they are in good health. You know, yes. It could. Sure. Yeah, and I think Allison will probably, you know, address that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a very good question. And that's, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, again, I, I want to emphasize that this is, um, you know, a conversation where you get education and, and talk with your physician about what's good for you, okay? Um, the ra radiologists kind of align themselves with the same, with that, with 
kind of like what the American Cancer Society guidelines are. Um, and that's what the, our, you know, our um, governing body, the American College of Radiology, you know, kind of goes along with. Um, you know, the U United States uh, Preventive um, Services Task Force, um, you know, recommend age 50 every two years. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying that to, you know, like as a pro or a con or what's, what I'm supporting personally. It's just that I'm putting out there so that you know what it is and what they recommend. Because, you know, you might hear this from your friends or relatives or your physicians. Okay, so, um, so, so that's what's out there. Okay, so I'm going to switch, um, switch it up a little bit and kind of go into, um, you know, the meat and potatoes of uh, breast imaging and understanding why we do and what we're looking for, okay? But before I do that, I just wanted to go through a little bit of anatomy so that you can understand what we're talking about, okay? So, um, of course, everyone knows where the breast is. It's sitting um, on your chest along the, um, what the, the muscle called the pectoralis muscle, okay? And um, there is, um, if I'd make a cartoon of uh, the breast, um, you know, there's the nipple, and I call this kind of like the plumbing system of the breast, but there's ducts um, that lead to these alveoli that make the milk, okay? And then the milk comes and drains out, okay? Um, of course, that only happens when you're lactating, uh, when, you're, um, when you have kids. But other than that, it's then, you know, ceases to do that, still makes some secretions, but not milk per se. Um, there's fat surrounding this, uh, the structures, and then there's fib fibrous tissue that is like the scaffolding of the breast that um, gives the breast shape, okay? So when we think about um, breast cancer and breast diseases, it, happen it happens mostly along these ducts and these units that are making um, where the milk um, would arise, okay? So, you know, if, if people get their mammogram, they, they get that view where it's kind of the more upright one. And so here we can see the pectoralis muscle and the breast here and most of the breast mound. And this is where we're focusing our attention on in looking for, for something that's in here. And that density, that's, the den that's what we refer to as the density in the breast, okay? So what's, how much white stuff do you have in your breast? And how much white stuff determines the breast density, okay? So, um, so breast density is actually determined by a combination of the different components that we talked about. There's the fat, there's the glandular tissue that gives rise to, um, the, that's the lining of those ducts, and then the fibrous tissue that's kind of surrounding and um, supporting the ducts. Okay, so fat tends to be black on those images and the glandular and fibrous tissue is white and that's what we're trying to look through to find something. Okay, so if I look at different um, mammograms, I don't know if you can see that with the lights, but there's a spectrum of density. So here is a, a fatty breast, so you see a lot more black and then you see here less black, a little bit more white and then more white, and then a lot more white. So this is dense. These two would be in the kind of dense categories, and then this would be in the non-dense, not dense categories, okay? So the problem is, is that the cancer is also white, okay? And so um, the more glandular tissue or the fibroglandular tissue that one has, the harder it is to find um, the cancer, yes. It does, it does, yes. Sure, yes, um, what happens is, so these are generalities, but young, younger women tend to have more dense breasts. Um, and as one ages, those um, glandular components can regress, okay? And, and, and it's influenced by the hormones. So as your hormones, as you age, your hormones start to kind of die down. And so it's the glandular the effect that it has on the glandular tissue can also kind of um, gradually die down too. But if you have a lot of fibrous tissue, that's why if you have a lot of fibrous tissue, that fibrous tissue doesn't get affected by the hormones. So the glandular t components can go away, but you're still left with the fibrous components. So that's why you might see 
we see a lot of women who are they're 80 years old and they have very dense breasts and it's just because the glandular tissue is went away but the fibrous tissue is still there yeah so it just varies okay so good question very good question so um, so finding that cancer is like you know finding a polar bear in an ice field you know like the polar bear is white and the ice field's white so you know how do you find that polar bear the it's it's um, uh, you know it's hiding in there that you have to look for it Okay, so um, cancers, so then you can think that, well, cancers are easier to see in women who have um, less dense breasts or more fatty breasts, okay? So, so here um, you, can, you can kind of raise your hands, like where do you think there might be an abnormal, ab abnormality, something that looks kind of irregular and white, on this side or on this side? This side, right? And then uh, raise your hand when the pointer gets to the finding. Uh, there we go. Okay, so you're all ready to be radiologists, right? So, it, you know, in a fatty breast, it sticks out like a sore thumb, right? So, so, that's, so that's easy for us. You know, here it is right here on the other view. We always do two views because we want to see it in two views so we can understand where it is in two-dimensional space. Or, sorry, three-dimensional space because we have two-dimensional views. Okay, so now here's a more dense breast. Can anyone pick out where there is a cancer in here? So does anyone, can anyone guess on this side? Okay, good. So, so where do you think? Um, this side or this side? Right, okay. Uh, toward the head? This is toward the head or toward the feet? Or the head. Okay, so then we do special views. Okay, here's a special view. Okay, so raise of hand when I get to it. Right there. Okay, so see this thing was hiding. We had to do a little bit of a special view to make it, you know, stand out a little bit. But you could see this white thing is in a sea of white. So it's harder to pick out. Okay. So that's the that's the challenge. So Dense breast tissue can mask or hide some breast cancers. And so that's why breast density can be considered as an independent risk factor for breast cancer. And maybe Allison might address that in, in her talk too. Okay, so because of that, you know, um, breast density has become a political topic, quite a, bit, uh, a big political topic. There are many states that are... Um, have legislation or are trying to get through legislation about informing women of their breast density. And so in April of um, this year, this law uh, went into effect, the Bre California Dense Breast Bill. And what it states is that it's, it will, uh, we are mandated to inform patients of their breast density, okay? And what it's just saying is that it, it's to raise your awareness and to take that information and to go to your provider and decide whether there might be some other screening options for you, okay? That's what this, every, every state's is, um, law is different, but this is the one that is there for California. So when you get your mammogram next time, if you haven't had one since April, when you get your mammogram next time, you will get some kind of letter with this wordage, we have to put it in by law, this wording exactly verbatim, that um, what your breast density is. And that's a prompt for you to go and talk to your doctor. Yes. It's the combination of those components. That's your genes and how you were, how you were made. <laughs> Everybody's different, okay? I think everybody's, you know, there's... There's just different, yeah, there's just, you know, different kind of, yeah, there's different groups that are, you know, may have a tendency, but what I've seen in practice, is it just is, it, it doesn't matter, you know, you, yes. Um, I don't think it's a matter of more likely, I think it's this masking effect, so it could be that, that we tend, in a fatty breast, we tend to find it easier. So it's not like fattier people tend to not get cancer. It's just that we pick it up, you know, more quickly 
So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a function of like what that masking is, you know, but do people with dense breasts get more cancer? I mean, I think that's something that's gonna pan out in, in some research and there might be some research. It's, it's like controversial, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that is a very good question. So that I'm going to leave to, you know, let, let's, let's readdress that question at the end when we've heard both of our talks. And then we'll take some more questions toward the end because I don't want to take away from Allison's time either. So, okay. So, but that's a good question and we'll address that toward the end once we get through. Okay. So, um, so this is a big question. Why do you have to press my breast so much? Why can't you just figure out something that, you know, will, so you don't have to press my breasts. And, you know, I'm a woman, I've had a mammogram done, and, you know, I wish we didn't have to press them so hard either. But um, I'm hoping that by educating you about why we do, you'll understand, you know, and let us do what we need to do so we can help you. And I kind of think of it um, this way, you know, uh, somebody was giving me this analogy a couple days ago where like women go through all sorts of things to get pretty, right? We get, you know, we do all the things to get our hair done, we get waxed, we get our skin peeled off, we do all these crazy things to look beautiful, okay? This is one thing that's painful, just like getting beautiful sometimes is painful, but it's, it's a little bit, one few moments of pain, discomfort. But I would rather take that discomfort than to miss a cancer, right? For myself, I would do that. For my kids, I would do that. So it's the same kind of thinking. I'm not saying to take away that discomfort. We, we will do whatever we can to take away that discomfort and make it less. But maybe if you understand why we do it, then you'll understand at least why we're, why we're doing it. So it really gets rid of those overlapping structures. And we're trying to differentiate something that's real and not real. And it helps us see through that dense breast tissue. Remember, your breast obviously is a three-dimensional, you know, object, and but we're putting it into a two-dimensional image. And if my hands are like, you know, the breast, the planes of your breast tissue, they're overlapping. When I press, when we press a little bit, we spread it out a little, so I can see things a little bit better. But if I have this blocking, I can't see through it, and I can't see what might be underlying that breast pattern. So that's why we, we compress so that we can get, um, get diminish that overlap. So I kind of have this joke about, well, we compress because we care, okay? We compress because we care. Um, also, the, be the better compression we get, the less radiation dose to you. That's important, okay? Very, very important. Um, I'm really, that I really, this is like my big to-do. It might not be, you might not realize that, but better compression leads to a less radiation um, absorption by your body. So that's good. So, um, and you know, the other thing is, is that better compression results in less blurring of the image. If you imagine these, um, like if I look through a dirty glass, you know, the, gla the light can't get through the glass because of the dirt, okay? Um, so I'm not saying that breast tissue is like dirt, but what happens is that the beam, the x-ray beam, is get going through the, the glandular tissue and it's ricocheting off of the glandular components and it makes the final image blurry. But if it can go straight through, it makes a more cleaner image, okay? So if I can get rid of that, o little bit of that overlap, there's less ricochet and a cleaner image, okay? If that makes any sense. Okay, so what are we looking for? We're, a lot of the things that we're looking for are white things. I, I don't mean for this to overwhelm you and you don't totally need to understand, but you know, you might hear, you might see this, some of these words in, in a report if you happen to get it. So these calcium deposits or calcifications, we're looking for masses, we're looking for changes in the breast pattern. Maybe one side looks like, you know, different than the other. The breast actually, when we look at it, the, the pattern is amazingly similar. It's like the, the halves of your face. One half looks pretty similar to the other. So we're looking for any asymmetry. Maybe you, know, you have a mole on one side of your face. Maybe you might not have it on the other. But if you happen to develop a mole on one side of your face, then I would pick it up because it's different. So I'm looking for that change in the pattern. 
um, any distortion, which can lead to distortion in the physical exam that you mentioned, and, um, and it, basically any new changes in the pattern or any other findings, okay? So, so when we go back, um, these, remember those duck, that cartoon of the ducks? This, the calcification, let, I'm gonna just point out these calcifications, it forms a cast of these ducts. And so we're seeing a cast of this structure. Same thing with a mass. If there's a mass in here, we're seeing the mass can make a, a cast of this structure. And so we're seeing, the, we're seeing the underlying thing that could be distorting this structure here, okay? So if you look at that, you know, we see these calcifications are casts of those little tiny ducts that are in the breast, okay? So here are some calcifications. These are very abnormal because they're very irregular looking, okay? We're looking for changes in pattern. This is somebody who had a mammogram in 2002, and then somebody had a question or comment before, you know, how does the breast change over time? They can become less dense. So this person did become more dense. There's more, you know, fat, more black in here, but some of that white still stayed. So how do we pick out something, you know? You know, what's different? Well, all of this changed, but this area looked a little bit different, okay? A little bit different. And then we thought we'd spot it out, meaning we put some more compression to get rid of the overlap and really didn't go away. And it still stayed with some sp specific views. So we did an ultrasound to find something. And we're looking, we use ultrasound as another tool to look at the breast tissue. Okay, and we're trying to define whether something is fluid filled or solid. So that's what ultrasound is very good for. And for characterizing um, a mass and seeing what it's doing. So here we see a mass and that was biopsy, it ended up being cancer. So I want to focus now on, there, well, there's a lot of different ways to look at the breast tissue these days. You know, thankfully, you know, we have great um, scientists and scientific advances that look at the breast in different ways. And um, if I could talk about all those things, we'd be here all night. But I'm gonna focus on something that's kind of new on the field. We have, um, that we have all these other modalities that we can use, but I'm gonna focus on something called tomosynthesis, okay? So what is tomosynthesis? Has anyone heard of, about tomosynthesis? Anyone? Okay, good. Okay, great. So then you're gonna learn something tonight. So tomosynthesis is a, is a very exciting um, technology that we have, and it's very similar to a traditional mammogram. And, but what it involves is multiple low-dose images of the breast, but they're acquired at different angles. And though it's like a CT scan. It's, I kind of, the analogy is like a CT scan of the breast. Okay, and everyone knows what a CT scan is? Get slices through the body, okay? This is like getting a sl multiple slices through the breast. And it's trying to address that issue of overlap, okay? So, um, so that's, and then what we do is we view it as a, a 3D um, constructed set of, of images. Okay, so it gives us a 3D sense now of the breast instead of just a 2D sense. Remember I said the breast is 3D, we make a 2D image, but now we're trying to get 3D into something that's more like a 3D um, image set, okay? So this is what it looks like. It looks like just like a mammogram unit, okay? If anyone's had a mammogram, this is, you're familiar with this, okay? So um, what happens is that this you're gonna be put in the same positions that you would for a mammogram, except now this tube, if you remember what that tube is, that tube is gonna swing around you, okay? So it gets a set of images, okay? So I'm gonna break from, from this slide for just a second, and I actually have a video that will tell you a little bit about, a little bit more about what um, tomosynthesis is. Volume. And C arm are sensitively designed with ergonomic features that maximize ease of use for the mammographer and minimize discomfort for the patient. Can you hear that? 
Okay. You want to pause it and see if we can fix it? Because, yeah, let's pause it for a second. Sorry, technical support. <laughs> Hold on for a second. Yeah, okay, we'll come back to this. Okay, so then we'll let them, oops, um, can you put me on, uh, thank you. Okay, so um, so what? why is tomosynthesis something we are excited about? Okay, um, there's been some trials that are actually looking at a lot of women. Um, they, these these um, large trials happen to have been done in, in Europe where they have um, very good um, uh, programs of screening lar their, their populations and keeping track of them, okay? So one is this... Um, the Oslo, the Oslo um, breast screening trial, which um, looked at 12,000 plus exams, okay? And then there's another one that was done in Italy called the STORM um, uh, tomosynthesis screening trial looking at um, 7,200 plus, you know, women, okay? And so these are pretty large studies. There's been other studies as well, but these are just two big ones that I wanted to highlight. And the nice thing about this, the great thing about this, is that there is 40% higher invasive cancer detection rate than a conventional 2D mammogram. 40%. That's a lot. Okay? And then um, this technology allows the radiologist to have enough confidence in the imaging so that they reduce, they have a 40% reduction in recall rates. How many people have ever had a screening mammogram and then they're told to come back, right? So that means if that, with this technology, 40, there would be a 40% reduction of that. So if there were 10 people in the room before, and then, you know, there, we would have let, well, that's a not a good analogy, but let's, there would be a decrease in the recall rate. I would have to call few of you, fewer of you back to do those additional views because of those special, images that I got from this modality, okay? So um, I don't know if this um, pro projects very well, but um, what happens is that this is an image without Tomo, so all of that dense tissue um, is kind of overlapping each other. And with Tomo, what happens is that you go through a series of images through the breast, okay? It's as if I'm getting CT, a CT exam through the breast. And so what that allows is that this problem of overlap, uh, we, get, we minimize the problem of that overlap. And it allows something to stand out more. So here is something that is a mass that has these hairs sticking out of it. We call that speculation. We don't like speculation. But it's a very irregular looking mass. Can you see that? OK. Can you see how it's kind of obscured here? You can't really see it as well. OK. So that's what. Um, Tomo synthesis allows to do, and you know it ha it's, can be seen with all kinds of breasts. Um, don't worry about this right here, but this is the this is the the regular two D view, and we call the Tomo synthesis a three D view. So here is something that's going through and looking at this, and this here looks like something looks like it's something worrisome, like a mass. But as we go through, we see that wait a minute, there's, there's not really anything there. This was just due to that, remember that superimposition that I was talking about? It was because of this. So if I saw this at the time of screening, I would have said, oh, this patient needs to come back. We need to do all those special views. But instead, I can just look at this at the time of the screening. We would acquire these images at the time of the screening. I can go through this image set and go, oh, wait a minute, that's just overlap. I don't need to worry about that. You don't need to come back for additional views come back in a year, okay? So here's a little bit more busier breast, and here you can see um, something here. Can you see that? That irregular looking thing, it looks like a star, speculated mass. But here, this is the 2D image. I'm having a hard time picking that out, but here it's very clear what this is, okay? So this is something, a little bit more dense breast tissue, right? Okay. Um, even more dense breast tissue. Can I convince you of that right there? That's very obvious. Here, kind of hidden. Okay. 
Here again, this is a very dense breast, very dense breast. But here you can see that distortion, okay? So it helps in all kinds of densities of the breast. So fatty to scattered to a little bit more dense to really dense. It's useful in all those settings, okay? And so that kind of brings me to the end, but this is a really important point because we talked about that density bill and what, what you should talk to about with your doctor. This is a thing that can be considered for one of those additional imaging um, screening exams, okay? So to summarize, remember a, a screening, breast cancer screening it includes both mammography and a breast exam. You have to have both, can't just do one. Know, your bre know thy breast density, <laughs> okay? Know your breast density, and you will get that information when you get a mammogram. That's the law. You will receive that information. Okay. So, yeah, so I want to move along and get through. So, anyways, know your breast density. Discuss these with your doctor, okay? Your risk factors, the role for the breast exam, the need for other imaging tests, and then any ch changes you notice in your breasts. And these are the other ways that you can, um, you know, get, have your breasts evaluated. This is something we talked about today, okay? And it allows us to look through the breasts. Results in higher detection rates and less So I will be talking today about breast cancer risk assessment, and I'll be touching on issues of genetic testing, screening, certainly with less detail than Dr. Powell did, but I'm going to talk about targeted screening and how we do that. And I'm also going to talk a bit about prevention today. Let's see if I can go forward. There we go. Let's see if I can get it up here, too. All right. Very good. So first I'm going to start with a bit of breast cancer epidemiology, giving you a snapshot of what we see in terms of breast cancer and other cancers in the United States. So on this slide here, you can see what is predicted for cancers in 2013. We see uh, cancer incidence, new cases on the left, and we see deaths on the right. And you can see that for women, breast cancer remains the leading cause of cancer, with more than 230,000 cases expected in the United States this year. When we look over on the right at cancer deaths, we see that lung cancer, unfortunately, is the leading cause of cancer death in women. Breast cancer is second, and that does actually represent a bit of success for breast cancer in terms of early detection and effective treatment. It certainly is also a reminder that women need not to smoke because that is the major cause of lung cancer and lung cancer deaths in this country. But I also want to underline that for the average woman in America, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is 1 in 8, or 10 to 12 percent. That number varies greatly according to individual risk factors, and I'm going to talk more about that. So this is a slide that also gives you a sense of the overall picture of cancer by stage. And this is a slide about breast cancer, but it really could be nearly any cancer that we see. And the point here is that when cancer is found early, people do very well. When cancer is found late with a larger burden of disease, we generally cannot cure it, and people unfortunately do not do well. And so really a stark picture, I think, in favor of our all trying to improve early detection and treatment so as to improve survival. And so this schema gives you a sense of what our opportunities might be to reduce cancer deaths. You can see here the progression, and I just show some pictures to illustrate, from normal breast tissue under the microscope to malignant breast tissue with cancer growing to, unfortunately, we can see cancer spread. And this is a bone scan of a woman who unfortunately now has spread of the cancer to her bones. And sadly, when it gets outside of the breast, it generally is not something we can cure. It's something we can treat, often very effectively for years, but not something we can cure. And all too often at that point, we do have people having an untimely death from cancer. And so the history of cancer therapy has really started here at, at the end of things. Basically, people were generally diagnosed when the cancer had spread, and we then can treat to improve symptoms, but not to cure. And over the last few decades, we've been able to move backward into early detection and thus early treatment before the cancer has spread. And that's when we do have an opportunity to cure. 
but wouldn't it be better if we could actually intervene even earlier before this ever happened and have the opportunity to prevent the disease? So that's our goal. But I think in order to do that, we have to have some warning as to who is likely to develop cancer so that we can fit the intervention to the level of risk and not over-treat or under-treat people. And so then we get into breast cancer risk factors and breast cancer risk assessment. So this is a table that shows the known risk factors associated with getting breast cancer in descending order of how much they increase your risk. We know that breast cancer is generally a disease of women. Being female increases your risk by 20 times over being male. Breast cancer is usually a postmenopausal disease, so five times more likely for postmenopausal women or women over age 50. But as we go down the list, the next most powerful risk factor is having a known genetic mutation, like the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation or some others, or else a strong family history. Now, there are a lot of other risk factors on this slide. They include things like reproductive factors, such as not having children or later age at first birth, taking hormone replacement therapy, uh, breast density, as you can see, is certainly a risk factor, as Dr. Powell described. And there is controversy as to whether it's just a masking effect or as to whether it might have some associated risk. It's really an interesting topic on which research is being done. So when you look at this, you really get the sense that across the population, the most common risk factors for breast cancer are things that tend to be reproductive, hormonal, lifestyle related. So age at, different, age at pregnancy, things like obesity, things like alcohol. But the highest magnitude risk factors are inherited. And so I think there's reason for us to pay good attention to both of those things in thinking about assessing risk. So this slide gives you a sense of the landscape of what we know about genetics in breast cancer. And to orient you, the y-axis, the vertical axis, shows relative risk. So a relative risk of 1 is no higher than average. A relative risk of 10 means that you're 10 times more likely to get it if you have one of those gene mutations. Here on the x or horizontal axis, we have allele frequency. How common is the mutation among the population from less than 1% all the way up to 30% of people? So you kind of get a sense of what we're looking at here, that there are some rare or very rare gene mutations that cause very high risk. There are some that are sort of in the middle, about two times the risk. And there are some we're starting to discover that are much more common but don't increase risk very much. So clinically, most of the action is really up here in the ones that are pretty unusual but increase risk a whole lot. Those are ones that we have studied the most and we feel that we know what we can do about them. There's increasing interest in moving down this curve. And at the moment, these are interesting but not really quite ready for clinical use, only because when there's a very, very small increase in risk, we don't always know how to respond to that. Should we change our screening? What can we do differently? So at the moment, we don't really have sensitivity in our interventions to react to very small increases in risk. But that's an area about which you should stay tuned, because I think a lot of work is going on. So it should be noted that the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations account for about 4 to 8% of all breast cancer and about 12 to 15% of all ovarian cancer. And here I'm talking about an inherited mutation that one inherits either from a mother or a father that's with one all through life from the moment of conception. So clinically, we've been testing for these mutations for about 15 years, a little longer than that. And we had it all sort of pretty well worked out in terms of how it was done up until this June. It's really been an interesting change, and I'll tell you more about that. But so business as usual with BRCA mutation testing was really based on risk assessment. So we had various ways, and we still do, of estimating whether we think a person is very likely to have a BRCA mutation. And so it's mostly based on genetic counselors and physicians who are experienced in this, looking at people's pedigree, their family history of cancers, and also their own personal history, and using statistical models to come up with a likelihood that will find a BRCA mutation. And so when that likelihood has been 5% or higher, generally our guidelines and our insurance companies have said, OK, it makes sense to pay for this testing, which has been expensive. And generally, the things that are red flags would be early breast cancer under the age of 45, ovarian cancer, anybody with ovarian cancer at any age should be tested, 
male breast cancer is another red flag. And another one is being of European Jewish or Ashkenazi Jewish ethnicity if there's breast cancer. And the reason for that is that this population, just by chance, has a higher prevalence of these mutations. So if you pull the average person in off the street, the likelihood that that person will have a BRCA mutation is 1 in 400, except if they're of Ashkenazi Jewish ethnicity when it's 1 in 40. So it's a very different carrier rate, and thus it takes a lot less to make us think we should offer testing to somebody of Jewish ethnicity. So generally, this testing has been via a blood test. It's also possible to do a cheek swab, but generally we think the blood test is probably a little bit more reliable. And it usually is by full sequencing, which is reading the whole gene forwards and backwards. So the cost has been generally in range of about $3,400. And up until June, it was only one company that could provide this test, Myriad Genetics. Three possible results. A positive means that on sequencing, a definite mutation was found. This is the answer for the cancer in this family. A negative means that we've read the gene forwards and backwards. It looks normal. We don't see a mutation. This is not the answer for the breast cancer in this family. And of course, the worrisome third possibility is a variant of uncertain significance. You can imagine, right? So it's generally a very slight change, often just a single base pair in the DNA. And we don't know whether it leads to a faulty protein and thus high cancer risk or not. Very frustrating for patients and doctors to have this result of saying, we're just not really sure. Because we've done a lot of testing of BRCA genes, we know a lot about them, and we've been able to get this uncertainty rate down pretty low to about 2 to 5% with some variation by ethnicity. But it's still a problem. So things really changed in May and June of 2013, and it is a brand new world for clinical cancer genetics, and I think a better one. We'll talk more about that. But so there were two big events, and one of them was that the Supreme Court ruled that one could not patent a genetic test, and so no longer would the patent hold that allowed only one company to do that. Literally within hours of that decision, emails were sent out from lots of competitor companies saying, hey, look, we have BRCA testing also. We have it cheaper. And we have it along with lots of other genes that you can get for even cheaper than you used to get just two. So it really has shifted the financial incentives. It used to be that we would only send two. It's becoming increasingly routine to send six or 15 genes when the costs are low or comparable. So it's really shifted the way we're beginning to do things. And so multiplex testing, meaning sequencing multiple genes at the same time looking for cancer risk, has arrived in the clinic. The other new and interesting event many of you may have seen in the New York Times when the actress Angelina Jolie published an editorial saying that she had a BRCA1 mutation and had chosen to do prophylactic mastectomy. Certainly, I think a very brave thing to do and done with the intention, I believe, of helping other women and helping people to know about their cancer risk. So interestingly, what, with what we call the Angelina Jolie effect, our clinical volume doubled. We've had to hire more staff. We now have a six-month wait list. This is true with cancer genetics clinics all over the country. So sort of remarkable the effect this has had. So lots of new stuff going on in the clinic. And so like I was saying, we're now starting to do these multiplex panels. So they all vary a little by these different companies that now have license to do sequencing where they didn't before. And this is a long list, but the upshot is that lots of other genes that have been associated with breast and other cancers are bundled into these panels, cancer next, breast next, colo next, and some of the others. And so that's what people are starting to order in the clinic. And I think sometimes it makes good sense because maybe you test your patient for BRCA1 and BRCA2, she's negative, but maybe you find something else that might well be the answer. However, for a lot of these genes, we don't quite know how important they are in determining breast cancer risk. So for example, NBN, MRE11, nobody really knows what to do with these when we get a positive. I've actually been getting emails from people internationally asking me what to do with an MRE11 mutation out of the blue. Um, so it really is interesting to be getting this kind of information. And I think we're in a place where our technology has actually begun to outstrip what we actually understand about these genes. We are learning quickly. 
very quickly as we begin to test people more widely. And so I think as we have more and more data on people getting tested for these genes, we're going to get more answers. But the point is that even though we're able to sequence the human genome, it's not always so simple. We don't always know how to interpret the information, and applying it into the clinic is a longer process. I do think it's ultimately helping people, but it's been complicated. So what do we do when we don't have a genetic answer for a woman's cancer risk? Well, at that point, we generally turn to statistical modeling, computer modeling. So this is a slide from a paper that basically was giving guidelines on what you should do if a person comes into your office and says, what's my risk for breast cancer? Help me out. Basically, the first question that you should ask is, does your patient have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer? If yes, genetics evaluation, genetic testing. If no, often they might have risk factors that are hormonal, like the ones that I showed you on that slide, potentially hormone replacement therapy, or benign breast disease. And so that's something where you know maybe a patient gets a call back by a mammogram like Dr. Pal showed us, and it turns out that they have to have a biopsy. The biopsy might not show cancer, but maybe it shows something like atypical hyperplasia, lobular carcinoma in situ, which aren't cancer, but they are associated with an increase in risk. So sometimes those women will want advice about how that should be managed. So at that point, we generally start using different computer models, which take into account people's family history, their personal history of things like when they had their first period, when they had their first child. Sometimes they'll take into account use of hormone replacement therapy, weight, things like that. And they will come up with an estimate, a five-year estimate, and a lifetime estimate of the likelihood of getting breast cancer. There are different models that are good for different situations. Unless you think that this is all sort of geeky computer talk, it is worth noting that, in fact, these models are written into the insurance code guidelines. And so, in fact, they do determine whether companies like Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield will actually pay for things like breast MRI, which we heard about, and some of the other interventions. And it's really all based on risk level. So I'm going to get into screening, and there'll be quite a bit of overlap with Dr. Powell's talk, so I'll be quick and going through it. Um, but so screening in the general population, mammography starting at age 40 versus 50. I'm going to come straight out, and I think that 40 is a good idea. Uh, you know, U.S. Preventive, Tasks, Preventive Services Task Force was interpreting some data suggesting that the mortality benefit is relatively small between 40 and 50, but it's not zero. So most of us in oncology would say 40. Clinical breast exam, generally every, every one to three years by a physician starting at age 20, yearly at age 40. Monthly self-breast exam. So here's my take on the controversy, and Dr. Powell, interrupt me if you think any differently. There were some randomized trials of breast self-exam. Basically, they split women into two groups, and they said, you group do breast self-exam, you don't. And at the end of several years, they looked, and there wasn't a difference in survival between the two groups. Now, those trials have been criticized. There's some evidence that the women in the exam group weren't taught how to do it, and that they didn't Perhaps maybe they weren't even really doing it. So there's question as to whether these trials even were conclusive. Basically, the US Preventive Services Task Force came out and said, we're not sure it has a mortality benefit, and we think it will make women too anxious, so they shouldn't do it. To my mind, that seems very paternalistic. I think it's really a bit silly. We get anxious about things all the time, and it doesn't make us fall apart, right? So uh, I actually think breast self-exam is a good idea. I see many patients who've found their own breast cancers. And sorry to be less um, diplomatic about it, but, but I actually think that that recommendation is inappropriate, and I think it's good to do. So. So the question then is, this, is this enough for high-risk women to do what we've outlined here? And I think Dr. Pell has nicely made the case that it's probably not. And I'll show you some more examples. So you've seen lots of dense breasts. Here's another one. I know you guys are experts now. Uh, and you can see that this one is non-dense. I bet you don't even need that arrow in the corner. See, I'm making it too easy. Dr. Powell made it hard for you. But there it is. I'm not a radiologist, so I need the arrow. Um, and then on the other side, we have a dense breast. And you can see, again, the difficulty in finding a cancer there. Um, as we've discussed, breast density has a tendency to be higher in young women and to decrease with age. And so the challenge with women who have an inherited predisposition, a genetic mutation or family history, they have a tendency to get breast cancer younger. So it's a bit of a perfect storm, right? Their risk is happening at a time when mammograms don't work very well for them. So that can really be a problem. 
And so that's the reason that we and others have really turned to breast MRI as an adjunct test. And it may be a bit hard to see here, but this is a 38-year-old woman whom we saw at Stanford. She had a BRCA1 gene mutation, so her lifetime breast cancer risk was very high. This was her mammogram, which was dense and was read as normal by our excellent radiologists. We then did an MRI of the breast. You can see the outline of the breast here. And there was a lesion in the middle that prompted biopsy and did indeed show an early cancer, which the mammogram had missed. This is a familiar story. Much bigger studies have shown that indeed, MRI is more sensitive. It can find smaller cancers than on a mammogram. It tends to find them stage zero or stage one, whereas in young high-risk women with dense breasts, mammogram finds them quite a bit later. But there is a downside to MRI, and that downside is false positives. We talked about callbacks, right? Well, that would be the problem with MRI is that, you know, it finds other things. So, you know, what's that? I'm sure Dr. Powell could say better than I what that is, but, you know, it's hard to know what these other things are on the, on the MRI. And so the decision was made in terms of guidelines that it was probably only worth adding MRI if there was a significant chance that anything you found might actually be breast cancer. And so that was an assessment about risk and how to adapt screening to risk. So really by convention, the threshold is two times the average risk. So instead of one in eight, a risk of one in four, or 20 to 25%. And women who hit that number are advised to get MRI on an annual basis in addition to mammogram. It is paid for by insurance. It is written into the guidelines. That is standard of care. How do we figure it out? We figure it out either by genetic testing or by doing those risk models that I told you about to get an estimate of risk. So I'm just moving on to talk about a few other interventions that sometimes people consider based on their cancer risk. Certainly the definitive prevention step in terms of breast cancer would be prophylactic or preventive mastectomy, removing breasts before cancer happens. Whatever a person's risk is, that will reduce it by 90 to 95%. It's not 100%, but it's as close as medicine can get. Even the highest risk women, women with BRCA mutations, only about a third of them will actually choose to do that. So the majority of the highest risk women still do not. Not acceptable, clearly, to most women. Prophylactic oophorectomy, or preventive removal of ovaries and fallopian tubes, is recommended for women with genetic mutations in BRCA1 or 2 because they also have a very high risk of ovarian cancer. And we don't actually have a good way to screen for ovarian cancer. We try with ultrasound, but it just doesn't work the way MRI and mammogram do for breast. So really the only thing we can do for these patients is to remove ovaries. And it's recommended to do that around age 40 for these women with BRCA mutations because their risk is high and it happens young. And when that's done, it does induce early menopause, which is no one's idea of something that they would prefer, but it does have a benefit of reducing breast cancer risk by about half. And so there is a big survival benefit since it is preventing two cancers for these high-risk women. In terms of another option, there is medical breast cancer prevention, medications that people can take to reduce risk. And these drugs are approved by the Food and Drug Administration, again, at that two times average threshold, about one in four or 20 to 25 percent. And again, you would get there for a, from a family history, genetic mutation, atypical hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ on a biopsy. So there are three drugs that we consider. The most commonly used is tamoxifen, which is a selective estrogen response modifier, meaning that it basically modulates the stimulation of breast tissue by the female hormones. It's a drug that's used very effectively to treat breast cancer, but also has been shown in many studies to reduce the risk of breast cancer by about a third to a half when you use it for five years. And we know that that benefit persists for at least 20 years. That's as long as has been studied. However, it does have some toxicities. These are rare, meaning the serious ones are rare. Probably one to two in a thousand women taking tamoxifen would develop a cancer of the uterus or a blood clot, which again, generally are not things that are fatal, but clearly are something we would want to avoid. Now that means 999, 998 out of a thousand don't, but it's certainly something that people worry about. Raloxifene is another drug that is similar to tamoxifen. Its other name is Avista. People may have heard of it. Um, it's also good for improving bone density, as is tamoxifen, by the way. 
Raloxifene is perhaps a trace less effective than tamoxifen at preventing breast cancer, but its risks of uterine cancer and blood clot are a bit lower. So everything is sort of a trade-off. Both of those are things that are approved and women often do take them for prevention. The other one is an aromatase inhibitor, exemestane. It's a drug that works a bit differently, but is also used to treat breast cancer. And one study did seem to show that it did help to reduce breast cancer risk in postmenopausal women. However, it does have quite a few side effects in terms of joint aches and actually makes bone loss worse. So I have reservations about that as well. So what about lifestyle? There have been a number of different studies of modifying lifestyle. Uh, some have looked at low-fat diet, some have looked at alcohol intake, and some have looked at physical activity. And there's a lot on this slide here, but I think it's safe to say that changing these behaviors perhaps has a modest effect on risk, not a big effect, probably a modest effect. And so in terms of lifestyle, we generally say it's probably best to avoid gaining a lot of weight over one's lifetime. Exercise is probably good. They really never found anything bad about it. It's good for what ails us. Disappointing to some of us who are a bit of a couch potato, but you know it seems to be good for everything, so good to do. Um, and in terms of alcohol, it's thought to be conservative to limit alcohol consumption to somewhere in the range of a drink a day or maybe three drinks a week in terms of thinking about breast cancer risk. But otherwise, not a whole lot of lifestyle interventions to recommend other, of course, than not smoking, which is important. So just, I'm going to end by talking about a few research priorities in this field. I think we need to get much better at assessing people's individual risks so that we really can know for whom is a drug like tamoxifen warranted, for whom is MRI warranted, and for whom is it really unnecessary. I think we need to get much better at our risk reduction strategies. It's really unfortunate to be talking about removing organs as our only option in 2013, and that's a major priority to get better. And certainly, we need to have a better angle on the long-term effects of these interventions. What is the effect on quality of life, on cost of care, all of those important outcomes. So I'll just show a few examples of some of our research related to these things. One question that interested us was, for a woman who's a breast cancer survivor, what's the chance that she could get a new breast cancer? This comes up a lot because sometimes women actually might consider a contralateral mastectomy, bilateral mastectomy, to reduce their risk. So we looked at this among 5,000 breast cancer survivors and found that it really seemed to matter whether the cancer was hormone receptor positive or hormone receptor negative, key features of breast cancers. And we found that if a woman's first cancer was hormone receptor positive, her chance of any new breast cancer was about double the average, and it really didn't matter in terms of hormone positive or hormone negative. But if a woman's first cancer was hormone receptor negative, which is the less common kind, her risk of any new breast cancer was nearly four times average, and of another hormone negative one was actually 10 times average. So it was rather a striking finding and made us think, gee, are there genetic findings we should be searching for in these women with ER negative? Certainly some of those probably have BRCA1 mutations because those are more commonly associated, but not all of them, and there are other things out there. And also this kind of information allows us to to start thinking about targeting screening and prevention for our breast cancer survivor patients as well. We had another study that we actually just presented last month, beginning to look at the value of some of these more extensive genetic tests in the clinic. So we had a group of 198 of our patients from our genetics clinic who, when we tested them for BRCA mutations, very kindly agreed to give us another sample for research. And so with their consent, what we actually did was to test those samples for another 42 cancer genes, just to see what we would find. And it was pretty interesting that beyond BRCA1 and 2, greater than 10% of our patients actually had a really important change in another gene. In one case, we actually found someone who had a predisposition to colon cancer, and we were able to do early colonoscopy and prevent a cancer for her. So I think there's evidence that these new genetic tests are going to help people. Again, there's always a catch, right, to all of these things. And what we found was that these variants of uncertain significance are pretty common. When you run a big panel of genes, the average was about five per patient of getting these variants that we don't know what they mean. Compare that to about only two to 5% with BRCA, where we know the genes better. 
And I think that's only going to be more of an issue as we move into whole genome sequencing. So there's a lot to learn as we think about how to balance this information, but I do think it's going to be beneficial. And finally, our group has been quite interested in thinking about how to help patients make decisions about managing cancer risk. We've done some work modeling different outcomes for women with genetic mutations, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And this is actually a computer model that we built that's available online. It's bracatool.stanford.edu. It's freely available. And basically, a woman can put in if she has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation and also her age. And she then can compare different strategies that she might choose for managing her risk. So screening with mammogram, with or without MRI doing oophorectomy, removing her ovaries, or doing mastectomy at various ages. And it then will give estimates of survival and types of breast cancer or ovarian cancer and allow women to rank them in order if they're trying to make decisions. So that's just one example of work where we're expanding to try to explain some of these things. So I'm going to conclude by just saying that hereditary cancer and genetic testing really represents a shift in the care paradigm. We're moving more into screening and prevention and less into playing catch up with treatment. And I really believe this is a preview of the future of medicine as these tests move further into the clinic. We believe that this kind of earlier intervention should improve outcomes in terms of quality of life and survival. And certainly the goal is to modify anything we learn from high-risk patients to the general population. So I'll stop there, just provide contact information for our Stanford Cancer Genetics Group. And I think maybe we might both come up and answer some questions, if that works. Okay.